Kuzu Zampo and a very good evening to all our viewers. I'm your host for the next half an hour, Karma Dendrup, and this is your monthly dose of Buddhism, the Chanchup Shing. Uh, for those who are watching this program for the first time, every month we, the BBS, uh, bring to the audience venerable Buddhist masters, uh, usually live to discuss Buddhist truths in an effort to better understand Buddhism. Uh, we have a very special guest for this episode of Chanchup Shing. Our uh, guest is Sogil Rinpoche, spiritual teacher and world-renowned author of the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. Welcome to our show. <laughs> and Tashi Dele to yes. everyone. The topic in discussion in this Chan Chup Shing is Buddhism and modern times. Usually Chan Chup Shing is a live uh, program, but since this is a recorded program, I would like to request our viewers to refrain from calling in. Uh, should you have any feedback and comments, you can email us at karmadendrup at gmail.com. Without wasting any more of our half an hour, my first question to Rinpoche is, who was or is the Buddha? Generally speaking, the Buddha is considered a human being, just like you and me, yes. and who through many years of purification, yes. as well as cumulative merit, some say over a thousand lifetimes, finally became enlightened yes. uh, as Gautama Siddhartha. But some masters you know, say that actually when he was born in India in the 6th century BC, around 6th century BC, as Gautama Siddhartha, he was already enlightened. And this was just an enactment of his uh, final enlightenment in his 12 acts, what's called Zepachuni. Yes. was the final enactment. Yes. Uh, after uh, he was born a prince, if I'm not wrong. So uh, after he attained enlightenment, after Gautama Siddhartha became the Buddha, what did he preach? Of course, the, in my little reading that I've done, he's uh, spoken about 84,000 volumes. But in a very basic, uh, simple uh, uh, version, if Rinpoche could share with our viewers. Like. First of all, when Buddha became enlightened, you see, he made a very powerful declaration. He said, Sapitu de Rosal and Dumachi, Dusutabi Chiki Kurit, Sola Tenchum Kwam, Mamma Nautines Neprasha. He said, talking of the direct experience of enlightenment, I think we can see you always used to say this. He said, profound peace, he was ex directly expressing, you know, uh, the, the state of the night. He said, profound peace, sub he. Truda is free of complexity, natural simplicity. Person Dumashi is uncompounded luminosity, because everything in this life is, you see, what is born must die, every meeting, separation, every gathering is dispersion. So, that everything's compounded because everything compounded is source of suffering and is impermanent. Whereas what you realize the ultimate, the truth of enlightenment is uncompounded, uncreated, beyond birth, beyond death, beyond description, as it says. So it is luminosity, the clear light, nature of mind, the state of enlightenment, substitutors and dimashe. The nectar like truth I have found, but so, to so. However, I shall share, unfortunately, no one is get, be going to be able to understand. So then he actually said to be retired into the forest, saying, I will practice myself. But I think my feeling is that then he, he realized the truth of enlightenment, but it was too direct, too profound for everyone to realize, even though everyone would have realized has the same potential of enlightenment as he, because he knew that all beings have, this is the unique thing in Buddhism, is that, particularly in our Buddhism, is that they have the Buddha nature, potential of enlightenment. Yes, yes. And on one deeper level, it is said in the teachings, in the teaching of Mahamudra and Dzogchen, the high teachings, we are already primordially pure Buddhas already on a deeper level, like the sky. Yes. Yet the clouds of obscuration, as is said in the teachings, Semchen and Sanji, the ancient lover to make. All sentient beings are Buddhas, but they are temporarily obscured by adventitious stains. What are the adventitious stains? Are the stains that come, adventitious stains are the stains that come, they are not intrinsic to your true nature, yes. but they lover, but they are also temporary. That means purified, like the clouds. Yes. Clouds obscure the sky, like this morning, it was really obscured, but then when it clears, the sky is always there. Like the truth of a true nature is always unchanging. Yes. As Buddha said, this uncompounded luminosity. And so, 
very much like that. And so he wanted really very much, what his main goal was to make all beings realize their true potential and, and oops, remove, purify their ignorance and negative emotions, destructive emotions, and then, and then to really bring up the realizing of that omniscience and bring it to the state of enlightenment. That he wanted to show. That was the main goal. But however, if you teach directly, no one's able to understand. So he retired, and I feel then he, uh, if you were to put it more in a simple, he developed the whole methodology, a way of, and then he started speaking, teaching very simply. He turned three wheels of the Dharma, turned the three wheels of the Dharma, three major teachings. First at Saranath, where he taught on the Four Noble Truths. The second at Vajrabi, uh, Rajige, or the Vajrabi Peak Mountain, yes. you know, in the, near Budgaya, you know. Yes. There he taught on the present Paramita, Wisdom Sutras. Yes. He talked on Shunyata or Tongbani, yes. uh, and which is the basis of Mahayana very much. Yes. And then he taught in uh, sacred places, he taught the Vajrayana. Yes. So three main. But the first is the teaching of the Four Noble Truths, which I will bring a little bit essentially here. But then, so they develop slowly in order to, according to the capacity of the propensity of each individual who began to teach. So that's why teaching Buddha is not one, but so skillful in, you know, for different people of different capacities. Yes. So you're asking me now to share a very simple, yes. Yes. a very simple essential. And uh, that, according to my master, like Ken Rinpoche, and others who always say, even though the teaching of Buddha is very vast, yes. like as you said before, yes. the word Buddha alone, what Buddha taught alone is over 100 volumes, yes. which is thank you. And the word of the great Indian masters is over 200 volumes, thank you. But that when he was asked to essentialize the teachings, he said, Dikpa chum mizyaki, gyawa punsun tsoba che, rangi semni unden sangi tembani. Dikpa chum mizyaki, dikpa is commit not a single unwholesome action. Yes. Now, but then you might wonder, how can I possibly not commit a single unwholesome action? But the real masters, you see, when the Ken Srimpas and others, when they really teach, they say, what it really means is, as much as possible, abandon all the negative, harmful actions of the body, speech, and mind, because that, are the, that is the cause of suffering. On the other hand, cultivate the wealth. The virtue means, you see, as much as possible, adopt a wholesome, beneficial actions, which are the cause of happiness. In fact, when you talk about the four noble truths, four noble truths are at the basis of Buddha Dharma. First of all, four noble truths are truth of suffering, truth of origin of suffering, secession and part leading to secession. Basically means Two is about samsara, yes. two is about nirvana. Because yes. actually it's quite complicated, but if I say very simply, yes. what it really means is that when you, like for example, when we are in this world, there is so much frustration, suffering, particularly in the modern world, stress. Yes. Stress is the dukkha, yes. or suffering dunga. Yes. And so much suffering, all this. So that is a fact we can see. But they're always taught on the, on the basis of reality. Now, but then Buddha said, suffering must be known, but also it cause must be banished. So you have to look, what is the cause of suffering? Cause of suffering is ignorance, negative emotion, negative actions. So that we must abandon. Yes. Now, then if you say, is there a way out of the suffering? There is, that's nirvana, yes. secession. Secession means secession of suffering, there is. But how to follow? Following Wisdom, knowledge, and wisdom, yes. which counteracts ignorance, overcomes ignorance. Then positive emotions such as love, compassion, you develop that. And engaging positive, wholesome, beneficial actions, which will result in, ultimately, in the happiness of lasting, lasting happiness of enlightenment. Yes. So in some ways, you know, uh, by following the book, that we can attain the cessation of nirvana, but then there is, we must follow the path. So Buddha laid out very clearly the path to enlightenment. So
So these are four noble truths are the basis. So therefore, the, to make it simple, if you're not already lost, <laughs> <laughs> first is commit not a single unwholesome action, which means basically don't harm. Don't harm. Many great lamas always say, if you cannot help, at least don't harm. Most important of all, don't keep malice and hatred in your heart. Yes. Keep your mind and heart pure. Yes. Secondly, cultivate the wealth of virtue means, of course, the first one is, if you don't want suffering, then you must remove, because everything is cause and effect, legunde, because everything is interdependent, legunde. So therefore, if you don't want suffering, then you must abandon the cause of suffering, which is ignorance, negative emotions, and negative actions. And if you want happiness, then you must develop wisdom, knowledge, positive emotions such as love, compassion, and beneficial, meritorious actions. Yes. So that's the, really the basis of that, what Buddha taught. So therefore, very much, you see, so most important, as the great master say, Lama say, uh, don't harm, refrain from harming. And make the first point is actually, but say, do not harm. Because if you harm others, actually you harm yourself most. Yes. If you help others, you help yourself most. So therefore, not to harm. Second is very much, instead you help others and develop good heart, kindness, and compassion. Like Dalai Lama, I had the honor to uh, accompany Zul Dama first ever visit to the West. And on that occasion, he would always say, my religion is very simple, my religion is kindness. Really developing the always the good heart. Because in our culture, in our spiritual culture, we value good heart. So much so that there was a great master called Atisha, yes. great master of compassion. And he, whenever he meet people, he would always ask, you know, he would not say, how's your family, how's your, you know, health or cat or dog. No, he would just ask, how's your good heart today? Because good heart is most important. Because good heart we have, we must develop that. If we develop the good heart, that is the uh, basis or the raw material of, of Chanchuk Chisen, yes. of Bodhi, Chanchuk Chisen, and also uh, enlightenment. Yes. So the first thing is abandoned harm. Second thing is cultivate uh, virtue. Basically, it's interesting. Like Kenzo Rinpoche used to say, these three lines, uh, Commit not a single unwholesome is basis of basic vehicle, Hinaya. Yes. And cultivate well virtue is basis of Maya. Yes. And tame. to tame this mind of us, basis of Vajrayana. Yes. Also, you can put it very simply the commit not a single unwholesome action, basis of peace. Cultivate virtue is compassion. Yes. To tame this mind is wisdom. Peace. Compassion, wisdom. Very simply like that. Yes. So, those are important. What we see, we must abandon negative actions. You know, because, for example, you know, the basic practice that's done on the basic level of the Buddha Dharma is taking refuge. Chamdo, yes. Once you take refuge, then you must, the precept of refuge is not harming others. Yes. Refraining from harm is the basis of the basic vehicle. Then in Mahayan, of course, is developing uh, love, compassion, yes. and the realizing wisdom of Tongbani Ushunyata. But the most important is the third line, Ranga Semdeons, to tame this mind of ours. In fact, many great masters like Nujin Kenbuche, who lived in Bhutan, yes. and he often used to say the entire teaching of Buddha, if you were to say, you know, is summed up to one statement by the Buddha which is Ranga Semle also do, to tame this mind, to overcome, to transform this mind of us. Because if you tame or transform, conquer this mind of us, then what happens? Our own experience and perception is transformed. Thereby, even the appearance circumstance is different. I know very much that, you know, if you work with, if you work with the teachings, work with meditation, compassion, and higher wisdom and nature mind. Really, when you transform your mind, all of your perception experience transform. Thereby, even the appearances would be different. How you see life is different. You have more pure perception of things. Without, you know, because our perception is very much 
marred by, even according to cognitive, founder of cognitive therapy, that you see generally, if you have something like anger, a lot of anger, 90% of your perception stained by anger, only 10% of reality. So that's why in the teaching on the pardos, you know, by Guru Mbache, the main thing for human beings in this life is what is the main task? You know, simply is to purify perception, purify mind, and realize the true nature of mind, essence of mind, nature of mind, compassion of mind. So the main thing is to transform the mind. As Buddha said, you see, all fear and anxiety come from an untamed mind. And he further said, there's nothing to fear except your untamed mind. I mean, it's very wonderful. I find it's very, very... Because we have all kinds of fears, anxiety, but actually we, we think of things that we need to fear, but ultimately it's our mind, how we can cope. If you can cope, work with your mind. That's why I think teaching is extraordinary. It's a tool that we need this modern life. We have so much mental suffering and fear which I think is also creeping in Bhutan also, yes, among the younger generation people, you know. So yes. really, teachings are so relevant. They really bring peace, you know. So very much, really, the simple message is to really to overcome your mind. I, in fact, if you were to say very simply, what is Buddhism? Dalam always said that. Now, more recently, he's saying, what is Buddhism? Buddhism is transforming the mind. Even though, of course, in our Vajrayana tradition, we have ceremonies, we have, you know, mantras, we have dances, you know, actually the main point is not these. The main point, of course, these are very important aspects, of course, of the, of the ritual aspect of it, but the most important thing is transforming the mind, because when the lamas and do, do, do practice, is they actually purify their mind, their pure perception, and through the visualization to purify the impure perception, through the mantra to purify the sound, and energy and through the mind transform, to meditation transform the mind. You know, it's very much about transforming our body speech mind into the Vajra body speech mind, that going a little bit deeper. Yes. So I'm just kind of, you know, spicing up a little bit here and there. Yes. Uh, and that very important, therefore, is it, it, main thing is about transforming the mind, really, transform the mind. Yes. Buddhism is about transforming the mind. Yes. Uh, Rimuji uh, touched upon and actually did speak about uh, the Deshanyambula okay. and the uh, Buddha nature. And Rimuji also touched upon interdependence, Tende. Mm. So uh, my, my next uh, question to Rimuji is if, if Rimuji could speak to us uh, a little bit more specifically about this Buddha nature. Love, because I feel that so much of us uh, who are in samsara, uh, the fact that uh, there is uh, such a concept or a philosophy such as the Buddha teacher gives us hope yeah. that uh, we can also aspire to become Buddhas. So if Rinpoche could speak I, along those lines. Um, you see, I found that uh, the teaching of Buddha nature is so valuable in this particular time. I notice with many of my students, when they go through self-doubt and also confusion, others listening to teaching of Buddha nature and really realizing its ultimate message is so inspiring and uh, so confident inspiring yes. in a self-value. Because what Buddha nature uh, or Dehi in Himbo, Devarakhi in Himbo, Devarakhi in Himbo is actually, uh, there is bliss, Devarakhi, gone from bliss to bliss, Himbo essence, Basically means essence of happiness, <laughs> essence of bliss, which is enlightenment ultimately. And enlightenment is the lasting happiness. So they were keeping him. That is the Buddha nature. But as I mentioned earlier, when Buddha became in, he realized that all beings have the same potential as him. And he wanted to really show that. So uh, also Buddha said, all beings are Buddhas, but yet they are obscured by advantage stains. Once these stains are purified, they are Buddha indeed. Yes. That means what is happening? I think the example is very much sky and clouds. Our true nature Buddha is like the sky. And also something meaning of Buddha nature, you see, is that we all have the Buddha nature 
that Buddha nature is always pure, pure, never stained, always pure like the sky. However much the clouds are, actually, clouds are only on the surface, doesn't really ever stain the sky itself. Like that, all our obscuring defilements are temporary. They don't really affect our true nature. And that is so amazing. I think that's something very amazing because I think sometimes in like, you know, uh, like in Christianity, they speak of original sin. But in Buddhism, we speak of not original sin, original purity. <laughs> original purity. And so there's so much hope. It's really, uh, you know, it's really a gospel. <laughs> <laughs> good news. Gospel means good news. What good news then say that we're already pure Buddhas anyway. But yet because of ignorance, negative emotions, obscurations, these things, it obscure like the clouds. So we need to. But these stains, these are only in Tibetan, lobru means only temporary. or ad, ad, temp, Lobru means it's just something that's... Uh, kind of comes from outside. When you look at the dictionary, what in Lobur means, and in, a Tibet, in a English translation is advan advantageous, means it comes from, it's not intrinsic to your nature, and it's only temporary, so it's purifiable. We say there's one good thing about the Dikpa, negative karma, is that it's purifiable. Chansa, that's why that you see, so we need to, of course, only thing is this teaching is only shared at the highest level. And when Buddha in the third turning of the wheel of the Dharma, he spoke about Buddha nature, the Hinimbu, and clear light nature mind. You know? Because ultimate nature mind is, as Buddha said, Sema Sema, the same Jana Yosa or mind is devoid of mind. For the true nature mind is clear light. So he spoke about that. So Buddha nature is really the kind of the the ultimate, you know, the inspiration ground of a being. It's really the ground. That's why when my student listened to these teachings again and again, it really restored him to the to the confidence and then really restores a faith. And then the amazing thing is, you know, particularly it's important, Buddha nature combined with the teaching by if you have fortunately received teaching on the nature of mind, which I'm going to do also here. Yes. I always teach on nature because that's the most important thing. I mean I mean, nature of mind is the most important thing, you know. And so that if we been introduced nature of mind a little bit, you know, ultimately. And then that, when you introduce nature of mind, that nature of mind is the Hirhimbu, the Hirhimbu. And then when we practice the true meditation, we can realize and gain confidence in the true nature. And that's why when you realize more and more, then master like Nimbu Kenshin, but you completely embody it, it becomes so powerful because of, that's one. Yes. Was that uh, yes. okay? I, I would just like to. I, 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 my question was not fully complete. Uh, to um, interdependence, yeah. And, uh, and, uh, before I go into interdependence, mm -hmm. uh, another question or a follow up on uh, Deshinyumbu is: Is there any difference uh, in in say because Deshinyumbu? The little reading that I did, I saw that even dogs, insects have Deshinyumbu, and mm -hmm. even humans have Deshinyumbu, mm -hmm. and along those same lines, uh, a, a person, a high official or a sweeper also has Deshinyumbu. Really? So, is there any difference between the Deshinyumbu that, uh, uh, say, a minister has or a sweeper has? Oh no, same. Yes. Deshinyumbu is really with all beings, really all sentient beings. Uh, Rimushi, my next question: uh, interdependence, yeah. uh, tende. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've, I've tried to read it myself also, and I've, uh, we've uh, had discussions, we've spoken as friends, I've heard people speak about it, I've heard, uh, read uh, books about it, but it's, it's always a little bit up there. It, it's yeah. not really, I doesn't really come down to us. So if Rimuchi could um, make it simpler see, again for us. I think to put it very simply, um, as I shared before, when you said commit not a single unknown service, and the main message is don't harm others. Because if you really, you know, if you really look what's good for you, if you really examine, not from an altruistic point of view, but from, even from an enlightened self-interest point of view, if you really look, Dalam always used to say, don't be foolishly selfish, be wisely selfish. Yes. So if you be wisely selfish for yourself, you have to think what's good for you. Then if you really examine, Harming actually is not good for you. It harms you. 
you hum and hum, it boomerangs on you. Helping actually helps you. And from that, when you realize that first, okay, you don't harm others because purely from your benefit. But when you realize deeply, you realize that, ah, my happiness and my sufferings connect with happiness and suffering of others, that we are all interdependent. So when you realize that, then you realize, you know, that inspired into more altruism. So that the, also the view of interdependence is something very practical. You know, Dalam says this very something very practical. For example, you know, if you get angry with somebody, and then you get really, you begin to get, you know, more and more angry thinking of the person, and then, you know, neurons and brains, they like to, you know, very much gossip, saying, oh, that's terrible, terrible, and you get more and more angry. But that's when you don't examine. You think that particular cause is that particular person. But if you really take a little bit back and examine that actually there are many cause and conditions, many cause conditions. It's not only this person. This person may be a little bit involved, but there are many, many cause. Even you yourself may be implicated. Mm. So when you realize that, you know, that's looking from an interdependent point of view because there are many, many cause and conditions. Things are not, you know, very simple. And so when you start seeing from that point of view, then actually when you really examine that way, it diminishes the anger and that the person who initially was the object of anger begins to kind of a little bit evaporate. Mm. And really, therefore, overcoming violence and overcoming the harm, overcoming aggression. So this is very much a very practical thing. <laughs> and then, of course, a more on deeper philosophical level, that you realize that things are all in it. Because the reason why things are, things are imp impermanent is also connect. Like, for example, when you saw uh, uh, rice eat, you get rice back. You know, that's also because of interdependence and cause and effect. The interdependence and leg cause and effect and as well as impermanence all connected together. Mm -hmm. you know? And then ultimately the view of, view of interdependence when you develop highly deeply, it re brings you the realization of Tongbani. Nelu Tongbani, the ultimate nature of that. Yes. So when you do study philosophy, there's a lot of study of the temper, you know. Yes. Uh, Rinpoche was mentioning about the Dalai Lama. I did a reading of the Dalai Lama where he says that uh, a modern perspective of uh, interdependence, he spoke about the fact that the clothes that I'm wearing, uh, the, the, the table that is in front of us. It's a product of so many people coming together from so many places. So that kind of uh, helped me out. So if uh, along those lines, if Rimuchi could uh, share something about that wisdom of okay. interdependence. Okay. When we really examine the, the ultimate nature of everything, in Buddhist teachings, the ultimate nature is called Tongbani or shunyata. But the tongbani is, tongbani is not emptiness or not nothingness. In fact, there's a wonderful definition. It's called takche tantawa. It means it's free of permanence and non-existing. It's neither permanent nor non-existing. Like take this glass, okay? When we look at it, it looks as though it's been there, you know, forever. And trouble with us, moment something exists, we think it's permanent. We attach permanent to existing and therefore we grasp. Hence, when we realize it's not permanent, then it breaks our heart. Yes. 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 Okay. Now, what I do? If I throw this glass on the heart. I won't do that now. <laughs> if you do that, the glass will break yes. and it will be pieces. And the pieces, if you break them further and further into atoms, and atoms also modern things that do no longer exist, field of energy. So therefore, it is not permanent. It is empty. Yes. Yes, yes. But yet, 
it is not nothing because it exists. We see. So then you might ask, but how does this glass come? It's because of many cause and conditions. As long as these cause and conditions exist, then it appear. In fact, there was a, a experiment that someone showed me that when you put a particular chemical, if you move in a particular circle, it disappears. In another way, it appears. Like that. So it's kind of, you know, because of many cause and conditions that it appears, you see? So therefore, it's nothing. It is not nothing. There's no such thing as a glass that exists permanently, a permanent existing entity called glass. Because if this exists, all glass would be the same, you know, one shape, you know. The yes. fact that all different shapes means it's also permanent. So it's, but nature itself, the essence of it is empty, yet it appears, it exists, like you. We are empty, but yet we exist. We are a proof of that. So how do we appear? Because of many causes and conditions. Many causes and conditions. That's why we each are unique of yes. causes and conditions. Yes. And that's why also our body, for example, you know, when our functions, all these things exist, we live. When they fail, we die. Yes. So, uh, therefore, I think the wonderful thing about that, what does that really teach? Practical teaching of that is that teaching to show that things are not permanent show that we must not become attached. We must let go of attachment because attachment is the cause of suffering. We must love. Yes. We must have compassion yes. beyond attachment. Yes. And then yet it says when you say it's empty, if it's like, you know, empty, if it's nothing, then you fall into the category of nihilism. Yes. There are two philosophies, existentialism and uh, substantialism or materials and nihilism. Buddhism goes beyond that, called the middle way. And so, therefore, it's, it's not nothing because there is cause and Conditions. A condition yes. and as a result, we must be ethical. Yes. We must be, you know, uh, respect each other. We must respect karma because, you know, as Guru Mbich says, though my view is as high as space, my, my respect to law of cause and effect is as minute, as precise as a grain of flour. Like flour, you make, you know, uh, bread and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So therefore, interdependent things, everything comes because of interdependent. And main things interdependent cause because of a karma. Le, you know, because of a karma. Le, you le. Yes. Contentment is a term or a word that keeps popping up whenever one reads Buddhism. So if Rinpoche could share your thoughts uh, with us on contentment. La. The real, the word contentment is chohi, yeah. which when you really look at, you know, the old wise folks, and sometimes the very simple, wonderful monks and nuns, there's a really sense of contentment, you know. They say, oh, if you have a roof over your head, clothes on the back, have food in your stomach, I'm happy. They don't have too much desire and, you know, craving, and, you know. They don't look so much for happiness outside of themselves. And so they really, that's kind of content. Sometimes like such monks, even they may make you a cup of tea, you know, it's so cozy, you know, and really so delicious. They really exude such kind of contentment happiness, you know. That comes from, uh, you know, having a good sense of one's being because the trouble with us in the modern world is we're always looking for happiness outside ourselves. It is said by the great Master Pass, it's only the foolish that look for happiness outside. Them. Because once you look for happiness out, you have no longer control. The wise and learned know all the cause of happiness is present in our mind and heart. So that same thing, as I said earlier about most important thing teaching Buddha is to transform in the mind. It's really a sense of being. Like, you know, we, don't, we lost the sense of being. In fact, a, a French philosopher, Pascal, once said, all of man's difficulties rise from his inability to sit quietly in a room by himself. So you don't know how to be. You're always doing, speaking, thinking too much. We lost the sense of being. The sense of being, that simplicity, the natural sense of being, is really a way of coming to touch with ourselves. You know, when you, otherwise we're all scattered everywhere, scattered, you know. 
I always say they'd be scattered if nobody's at home. So there's no contentment. So that really key to happiness is actual contentment, deeper mental contentment, peace, which is really brought by through the teachings, which is really a way of um, you know, bringing a sense of being, like through meditation, through nature mind, really, a sense of being like this, you know, like this. <laughs> Whenever we go live, we keep getting callers uh, at least once in every show the asking a shortcut to Nirvana. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to ask Rinpoche if there is a shortcut, la, and if there is, then what is the shortcut to Nirvana? Um, you see, in the highest teachings of Vajrayana, as well as in the Mahamud and Dzogchen teachings, they really they show us the nature of mind, what a true nature of mind is. By realizing true nature of mind, we realize the potential of Buddha nature and become united. So really, and it's about, as I earlier said, about transforming the mind and really working with mind. And if you have fortunate enough to meet a great master, and if you're fortunate enough yourself to follow that, yeah, it is possible. But it's difficult. And often masters say, you know, you know, those people who are very much Lama Koncho, you know, simple mind, and just really trust the Lama and Koncho, they make it. Like there's a story of one master, uh, you know, who became a very great master. He went to see this master who was his, you know, and he, the master was about to leave. The lama was about to leave. So he, he came there. He said, please, would you give me a dhamma? And most important thing, please give me. And then the master said, this is it. He's, because he was in a hurry. He was about to go. He said, you know, he held his hand and said, you are impermanent. I'm impermanent. You are impermanent. I'm impermanent. You are impermanent. I'm impermanent. Just practice this. So he went and practiced. He realized also, there was a great Mahasiddha, India, who actually a thief, a robber, who later had tremendous renunciation, and went and, you know, Dujumbaj told me the story, followed this master. And then he said to master, I'm no good at anything. He said, you must be good at something. And he said, well, I'm very good at stealing and robbing. He said, well, that's exactly what you need. I want you to rob all your perception, all your now, all your perception." dissolved into the belly of emptiness, you know. I mean, when you have great masters show you directly like that, there's a possibility. And also, it means that one's karma must do certain acts should be ripened to be able to meet such a master. And, you know, but there is, uh, I wouldn't say shortcut. There's a swift and direct path. But actually, it's up to you. My final question to Rinpoche is uh, that we, we uh, the length of this half an hour, we spoke so much about so many deep and profound truths uh, which uh, Rinpoche has made so simple for our viewers. Uh, my final question is to, to the desire to have it even more simpler, a daily sadhana or a practice that uh, uh, one can practice, our viewers can practice in their day-to-day life. Uh. We're in a really um, blessed and sacred land and uh, People have very much faith in the Buddha and the great master. So the main simple thing is you see to really invoke in the sky before you the embodiment of you see all the Buddhas and all the masters. Whatever may be for you, maybe for some it might be Guru Mbache, or some it might be Jenresi, for some it might be Jizunduma. Or Tambashachatuba, Buddha himself, or Amitabha, whatever it may be. You see, my master used to say, and Yushin Kim particularly used to say, whatever, like if it's Guru Mbache you invoke in the sky before, you consider him as the embodiment of all. You consider Chenrezi, Jitsunduma, everything is in him. If you do that by practicing one, you accomplish all, like a wish fulfilling gem. So you should consider invoking the sky before you, the embodiment of all Buddhas, for me personally, is Guru Mbache. And so as soon as you invoke, 
they will be there even if you don't see them. As Buddha pledged, he said, whoever thinks of me, I'm in front of them. So that's to really have faith in that. Guru Mbachi said also, to the one who is devoted, I'm never separate, you see. So but that really trust, and it's true. Because in Buddhism, faith is based on reason. You know, faith based on reason. And it's, and when you practice, you can really feel. So invoke that in the, in the sky before you, and first take refuge for yourself and for all beings, particularly those close to you who are sick, or people who have died, those in the pardo, you take refuge. You know? So guide us, look after us until we attain enlightenment. Second, generate the heart of enlightenment, which is bodhicitta, chanju sem. You have to really think that, you know, you know, that may all beings, you see, become free of suffering and the cause of suffering. And may all beings have happiness and cause of happiness and the ultimate happiness of enlightenment may all have. You know? So I really practice whatever I do is dedicated to the ultimate happiness, which is enlightenment of all beings. So always dedicate that. You know, generate your heart of moti motivation, of vast motivation, Bodhicitta. If you do that, even a small practice, like Om Mani Peme Hum, just one single Mani Peme will be extremely powerful. So if it's governed by, it is said, the three noble principles, you know, which is the motivation of Bodhicitta, Chanchu Chusem, at the beginning, which is good in the beginning. In the middle, if you have view of uh, shunyata or tongbani, which is a non-conceptual, non-referential, which is more like resting a little bit in meditation, nature, mind. And then end the dedication, which is good in the middle and good at the end. Then even a single omani pemehu would have a tremendous power. So that's why it must be held with the motivation bodhicitta, the beginning saying, whatever practice you do, that we dedicate for the ultimate enlightenment of all beings. And then the main practice is then, you see, you invoke, you make a heartfelt prayer. You know, if it's to Guru Mbache, do the seven nine prayer of Guru Mbache. And then his heart essence, Om Mahom Banjangu Pemasidamu. If it's Papa Chenesi, do Om Mani Pemehu. In fact, uh, during my teachings here, I'm distributing to people the, these different prayers. Yes. And prayer to also for the moment of death. Uh, and so, you know, what you do is you make a really heartfelt prayer to whoever the embodiment of truth for you may be. I will look to show Papa Chenesi or Guru Mbache. Heartfelt prayer. And then, and say, Om Mahom Banjangu Pemehu, say, Om Mani Pemehu. When you say Om Mani Pemehu, to really, Mani Pemehu is where, is to, Purified all the negative emotions of beings, particularly for the part of the beings, you know. And so that because negative, destructive emotion the cause of being born in the six realms of existence. So Om Mani Peme Hong is the purification of six realms. To yes. really that Om Mani Peme Hong. And then when you make prayer, you consider from the Buddha, Papa Chena Sri Guru Mbache, tremendous rays of light and blessing come, uh, white, red, blue or white Om, Red are uh, hung blue rays of light come as it touches your three centers. It purifies all the negative karma of you know, like your actual body, speech, and mind, and you're imbued with the blessing of body, speech, mind of the Buddhas. And at the end, Guru Mbachyo, Papa Chandras, whoever it is, dissolve into light and becomes one with you. And as it becomes one with you, then you rest in that state of that union and that oneness where your mind is completely one with Guru Mbachi and the rest in meditation. In the, in the sometimes amazing when you do like that, you can see the bless Guru Mbachi dissolves, become one with you. You know, really, it just when you do that, it does something to you. Your mind really gets transformed. There's a kind of moment of peace and kind of spaciousness. And you cannot quite say what it is, but it just comes beyond ordinary mind. There's something wonderful, very peaceful. You know, you can experience, and you can say that your now mind is one with Guru Mbache, one with 
generation, the rest in meditation there and, you know, in that union. And then when you rise from the dedicated merits, so they may all beings uh, attain enlightenment. And then, of course, during your life, always try to, you know, be generous, be kind, not harm, but help. I think that's the most important thing. And I think a uh, country like uh, Bhutan, particularly as it reaches to becoming democratic, I think it's very important the spiritual values, which are the source of becoming a good human being, you know. The Jim Jovi used to these three qualities of Zambo, you know, very good and kind, Tem and Tembo means stable, Flobo means very relaxed and ease and you know, easy to be with and others. And then, you know, the Yarap, you know, the good become decent human beings and to really respect very much the less and the ore karma. And if you be there you become good, then we be good human beings and we can contribute good way and we will not be then small minded, you know, and involved in small mindedness. We'll respect each other. That I think it's very important. And then also I think uh, when I'm going to teach this time here in Bhutan, I'm going to encourage about, about how to not become depressed. And uh, and to really encourage each other, you know, not become depressed. Human value human life is very valuable. And that we need to really value ourselves and really encourage each other, you know, and not lose hope, really. And enjoy life also, but not using drugs. There's a way to be happy. You know, by working with the mind, you reach to a state of bliss that no drugs can bring. Really so. Uh, I'm afraid that this is all the time that we have for you tonight. To all the viewers, thank you so much for watching and your support. In closing, the BBS would like to again thank uh, Rimoche for making time for us and sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us tonight. Love. Always a privilege. Thank you. Yes. From the production team here at Chubachu and everybody here at the BBS, good night, take care, and remember our Chanjip Singh slogan, analyze and realize.